Uh, regenerative agriculture, I've known for a while, is being embraced by farmers and agronomists across the world to revive our degraded soils and continue reaping from what nature has designed for us. Now, not since the agricultural revolution have we witnessed such a change in our adoption of practices. This is something I've witnessed through drought-stricken areas of uh, Western New South Wales as well as Queensland since 2016-17 when I began telling stories for Rural Aid and Biobal and also through Project Catalyst, which we've covered extensively from Mossman um, north of Cairns right through to Kamala and Camilla south of Mackay. So there's so many challenges facing both uh, agricultural pastoralists as well as graziers, as well as all of the people growing our food, textiles, whatever. And yet it is a return to the way our ancestors farmed that we now look to. In fact, that's part of the... Okay, hello? Do we turn that down? No? Uh, that's part of today's theme is Back to the Future, Enhancing Grazing from the Ground Up. Now, I found it really interesting that one of the most important innovations of the agricultural revolution was, in fact, the development of the Norfolk four-course rotation, which greatly increased crop and livestock yields by improving soil fertility and reducing fallow time. In the mid-18th century, two British agriculturists, Robert Bakewell and Thomas Coke, introduced selective breeding as a scientific practice and used inbreeding to stabilise certain qualities in order to reduce genetic diversity. I found that really interesting that it's been around that long. Bakewell was also the first to breed cattle to be used primarily for beef. So if you didn't know those names, today you do. Now, without further ado, I'd like to kick off today's presentations with Hamish Cato and Terry Begg. Hamish has cult cultivated a passion for regenerative mining land rehabilitation over the last four years in Collinsville with Glencore. And as an environmental scientist, his work has taken him from feedlots and export yards to wineries. I know which one I'd prefer to work in. Together with Terry Begg, station manager of Kiral and Landsborough Stations, they're working to improve mine rehabilitation through the introduction of cattle. And they're here to talk today about the positive impacts on the rehabilitation certif certification criteria. Please welcome Hamish Cato and Terry Begg to the stage. Beautiful. Um, thank you very much for inviting us here today to talk about um, the treatment of mine rehab through the introduction of cattle and the positive impacts it has on the closure criteria. Um, my name's Hamish Cato, as introduced before, working at uh, Collinsville Coal Mine uh, with Glencore. This is Terry Begg, he works for Clinton Pastoral, um, now over at Nebo, was at Collinsville previously. Yep, beautiful. <laughs> No, very good. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, in early 2021, another Glencore mine over at Newlands, they initially tried this process where they set up a trial area on their rehab um, to try and improve some unsuccessful areas, some scalded areas that uh, hadn't successfully rehabbed. It was based around a similar trial that happened at Glen Alpine Station run through NQ Dry Topics. Um, with that Glen Alpine Station trial, they implemented a holistic plan, so ultra high density grazing, where they boxed the cattle up in the evenings in night paddocks and concentrated um, those 1,200 head over a six week period. And they saw great results there. Uh, based on these trials, we implemented at Collinsville with the help of Clinter um, to replicate what happened at the Glen Alpine station there. The main, I guess, the main goal is to try and incorporate those organics into the scalded area and treat that soil chemistry, because historically we've just put uh, fertiliser on it and artificially improved that soil, but we're trying to go for a more holistic, natural approach. Um, like I've said here, this, this trial was developed um, to deliver an environmental outcome as well as an agricultural benefit to Clinter as well. So this is just a timeline overview. As you can see there, it started early 2021. Um, there was a fair bit involved in the setup of the trial being on a mine site. There was quite a few uh, OH&S hoops we had to jump through um, to try and get this all off the ground. We eventually got all off the ground with the help of Clinter and, and um, I guess some progressive people at the mine who wanted to see this go ahead. 
Uh, you can see there <clears throat> a lot of setup involved, then we weighed the cattle quite regularly and then took biomass cuttings pretty regularly just to gauge how, how much, um, I guess, the pastures were getting grazed down and whether we needed to, to remove the cattle from the trial paddocks. So the trial area was selected um, due to the proximity of cattle, water and feed. So this was an area that was rehabbed um, for about 10 years and it was at the western extent of the mine and that was adjacent to Clinter Pastoral. So it could easily just walk cattle across the fence. Um, and there was a very, oh, a very good example of poor rehab, um, which will come up in the next slide. But so divided that area into two paddocks. So that western boundary there, that's Clinter Holdings. So they could just walk cattle through there. Um, the paddock one, 64 hectares, paddock two is 74. Um, and then we just did the pasture budgets to manage how long we kept stock in there. This is an aerial view from the south, so that's that scalded area I was talking about. Um, <clears throat> no generation of, of vegetation at all, primarily due to the soil chemistry. Um, and that was one of, the, one of the goals of this trial, to try and improve that soil through, through I guess, defecation from the stock. Um, prior to the, to the commencement of the trial, we set up 12, 12 sample plots in that scalded area. You can see there, the left and the, and the centre, um, just, yeah, no ground cover, no established vegetation, uh, yeah, very poor rehab. And on the right-hand side there, that's some of the successful rehab. Um, so we set up five veg monitoring sites there just to manage um, how long we keep the cattle in there. Good morning, Noel. I'm Terry from Clinter Holdings. Um, once we got going with it all, we had to fence up the rehab country so we could put cattle in there. That involved in a couple of steep slopes where we had to bring fence lines down on the rehab country. So we had John, which is another manager of Clinter, which is really good with Woo Boys and Diverting Water, come in to help us. And we put in some Woo Boys just to slow water down and to um, stop any erosion happening man-made. So we did that. As you can see there, and you can see there as we brought it down, you can see water's puddled where we put some woo boys in, just to stop that water from getting a run up down them ridges. And that's been a great success on that side of it, to stop any, any extra erosion. Then I went in and done a pasture budget on the first trial paddock we started with. It was 64 hectares. I did my first cutting, it gave me nearly 9,680 kilos of dry matter to work with. By the time I took my calculations out of unpalatable um, moisture and detachment, I was back to about 4,600 kilos of dry matter usable in that paddock. And we, with the calculations, it gave us 20 days of grazing with 242 head of cattle. But continuing to monitor that, we could keep going because as we spoke with some of them yesterday, you can do your calculations, but you just got to keep monitoring your country and we still had plenty of feed where we could keep grazing. So we kept going with that. There's the grid of the breakdown from what we started with in paddock one. There's a land monitoring site myself and Beck Lathwell set up. And where you can see we've done a, we've chucked a quadrant, that's what's in our quadrant, and that's what's left after we've cut our quadrant of grass to do a weight sample. Uh, after we did the pasture budgets, then we just had a look at the soil, soil chemistry there. You can see, took a few samples from the scalded area, and then took a few samples from, um, where the rehab successfully established. And it was pretty obvious once you see this. Um, because our measures formed in a saline environment, so we've got a lot of um, sulphate there, and that pretty much drives the pH up. You can see where, where it's been unsuccessful, got low pH as a sort of threes, three and a half, so EC is quite high, and then yeah, sulphate's very high. Where we have got um, successful rehab, good pH, EC is good, and then pretty much no sulphate there at all. So. Through the, through the introduction of cattle, we're going to try and try and amend that pH and the chemistry in the soil. Um, so, 
So here you can see this is our scalded area we've chose to try and fix with the cattle. As you can see, it's on a quite a steep slope leading up to it where the water's... And then the second photo, you can see it's, it's created a hard crust and whatever water hits that, there's very little infiltration, if not none. So then it finds your dispersive soils as it runs down and then you start to get these erosions and that's what we're going to try and fix. So the scaled site prep, I went in here, that's what it started off as. Second photo you can see I've gone along and I've contour banked with hay just to slow the flow of water up and all that sort of stuff while we're, um, while we're getting ready. I've just step, stepped it enough that water can't run, like it can't get away from and just get a run up and just to slow it all down and as you see as we go forward to the next pit, that's an aerial view and go through to another, the, this is where I've introduced the cattle, so the cattle ideally are going to work all that hay into those areas and when they do I have um, liquor drums there, I add it in with molasses into them, you'll see a photo of that after, to um, keep the cattle concentrated on that area to just keep walking it in and while they were there too I'd add a bit more hay in the bare areas just to keep them binding that down into, the, into those areas just to stop that erosion happening just to steady everything right back up. As you can see, Sorry. just go back a As you can see on day one, the cattle were introduced. We had done beetle action straight away in there and they start to bore holes and then you start to get infiltration as well. That's a aerial view of the cattle on the site. Just a nice video of Terry and his dogs holding the cattle there. Terry, how long did you have them in that space? In that space there. They weren't locked on that space. What we done was we put the molasses there to bring them back to there every day to keep, get them to concentrate on that area. Their water was actually three quarters or oh, 500 metres back behind there where they watered and they'd come back up and, and get their molasses and kind of concentrate on that area. So as you can see here, with that scalded area I said before about the infiltration being very little, if not none, that was after nearly 20 mil of rain. You can see it hasn't even, it's just run and puddled. So, and as you can see, we've done the contour bait with the grass. We put the cattle onto that. And then the third step was the molasses liquor drums to keep the cattle coming back there. Because what we were after, there's moisture there. We were after the deep hoof soil massage to the soil to start to get the moisture, to, the infiltration to go in and break down everything as well while they're there, just to keep using their feet to do everything to the soil. And there's some more photos there. This is what we found. This here is manure that's been dropped on that site. It was full of your legume seeds, your buffalo seed, all the grass seed that they'd been grazing on in the paddock. They were actually bringing it back to that site and passing it onto the area. Then on the same area, I seeded the whole area by hand with millet seed. And within five days, because we were lucky enough to get some rain, within five days I had germination. And then from then on, it just kept growing and growing until we got, um, till that area dried out and then there was nothing for it to, with the soil chemistry and that, it just couldn't hold on. Yeah, this is another a lot of monitoring sites. As I went through with the trial, we, um, I monitored 10 sites across the two paddocks. When we talked about paddock one and how much feed we had on offer and that, and then it said I had 20 days of fodder for the cattle. It actually worked out being in paddock one, I had 42 days of feed. 
and that was still to keep a residual of 1,200 kilos per hectare left. It looked, there's some other photos as we get to them, this one over here, you start to see it starting to get a little bit open, but we needed to keep bringing that down, but the measurements were letting us keep going. With that, on the first 20 days, the 242 head of cattle on that 64 hectare paddock, they dropped 28, what was it, 28, 28 tonne of manure, 69,000 litres of urine, and they put in 38 million hoof prints across that site with 242 head for 20 days. So, yeah, so we just kept monitoring. That's the graph of what come out of it all. So I think just, just the important one of that one is, so the biomass came, biomass came down because it had been rehab for 10 years, it's old buffalo and then hadn't been grazed. So there was, there was plenty of feed there, but a lot of it wasn't palatable. Um, so just chewing it down, walking it in and then, but we've maintained the ground cover through the whole process. So haven't, haven't degraded that area. Yeah, so, so mine, mine's finished using it for whatever purpose it was, and then the post mining land use is grazing. And I don't know anything about the mining, so I'm going to preface my question to that. Yeah. Um, is this overcut mining? Yes. And nothing about the mining? No, 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 no. no. Uh, and, and the chemistry, where, where that, the parent material of, of, <laughs> of what's been dumped there. So that'd be spoil there, and then usually yeah. spoil. So, yeah. so it, it's, it's, yeah, material that we've finished with in the mining process. Oh, yeah, and it's been dumped there, yeah. And, and with that too, some, some places there, we're only working with 100 mil of topsoil. So, and I find with, with our cattle trials, and adding the cattle in and we're crashing the grass down, grazing it, getting it to photosympathise, getting everything back into your ground, we can increase the topsoil from the top and keep building on that. So it's interesting that you decided to do it in June and hope for rain. Well, we weren't hoping for rain. What it kind of was, why we tried the trial, it, it presented itself. Um, we weren't worried about when you look at the cattle, we weren't worried about weight gains. We more were looking at what we could do with the paddock, because the paddock hadn't been grazed for, say, 10 years. So we wanted to bring the, bring the cattle in, crash that fodder down, and see what we can do with it, and see what the um, reaction was to the grasses in them areas. We have bought some grass from the trial area. If you get a chance, on this end here, it's Gra buffalo grass from the controlled area. When I say controlled area, it's where the cattle couldn't get to to feed. It's exactly what the paddock looked like before we started. In the middle, it's another one from the controlled area, but I dare say some like a bit of native animal wallabies and that had grazed it. You can see a little bit growing through it. The end one was exactly like the first one when we started, if not a little bit worse. But once we grazed it, that whole clump is now fully palatable. The whole, if, when you get a chance, just feel through and you'll feel the difference in the root structures, the stems, the cattle can eat that right down to about four inches. Completely palatable. From one trial, one session in there. I guess, yeah, the, the main findings out of the trial was that <clears throat> it is a sustainable post-mining land use for grazing, like we we'll graze it down well and then the management of that grazing is what's going to make it successful. So you keep keep them in there, and then we're we're not obligated by anything to keep stock in there. We're lucky enough to have Clinton Parcel next door. So if they've grazed down to a level that is most benefit to the rehab, then we can pull them out that day. We don't need to have them there for any longer than necessary. Um, with that scalded area, Terry touched on it before, wasn't as successful in changing the chemistry um, purely because we just didn't didn't get the volumes there. Um, had the lick blocks there, had feed around that area but there was no water there so they were going down, there was a dam oh, about a K or so away and they end up just camping on that for most of the day and that, that's where most of the organics got deposited so um, 
yeah, a repeat of this, then we'll make sure that we put water up there so you can really concentrate those organics and, and, and get a bit more activity going there. Um, and so, yeah. so with that, we looked at a sustainable size and that's why we used the dam. It's not sustainable to put water exactly where we want it all the time because you can't do that all the time. If I were to put water on that spot, I'm fairly confident I would have got a, at least a three inch to four inch layer of manure because those cattle would sit down on that dam for seven hours, camp up and the manure, that's where the manure ended up. And then, yeah, just future applications for, uh, I guess, the mine and, and Clinter. It was mutually beneficial. The weight gains were very minimal. Um, but like I said, went in there in June, weren't chasing weight gains. Um, it was more about a, a vegetation outcome. And you can see that picky there. It is after some good, good January, Feb rain. Um, but you can see there on the left-hand side, it got grazed down. Um, that was the middle of last year. Then we got some good end of year rain, then it's all come back. If if we had just left it like that, you would have oh, would have uh, would have turned a bit, um, but wouldn't have had that growth like we had there at the start of the year. Um, yeah, we needed needed to concentrate that manure application a bit more by putting water on there. And every every year at the mine, we do annual rehab monitoring. Um, that's conducted in the middle of the year, and that'll give us a bit more guidance on future areas we can potentially expand this into, um, which will work out well. And with all that, like what I found in my in the trial with it all, if you don't graze this feed, your soil health's going down because it's not photosynthesizing, it's not getting your carbon, it's not getting your H2O, putting your carbohydrates and sugars and all that back into the ground. It's just taking everything out and slowly killing itself. As you can see on that first one there, the root systems as they touched on yesterday is only about that thick. It's not getting any deeper and not doing anything for the soil. And that's all we've got for that one. Any questions? What's the long term? Oh, sorry. So I suppose from Glencore's um, so what's the long term um, goal there? So to keep coming back into that country or to, you know, that, that landscape, that moonscape area once it's vegetated that you're going to leave the cattle out of there and, and leave it no so yeah the po post mining land use for that area is grazing so to get it certified it needs to be safe stable um, self-sustaining and non-polluting so we'll get it certified and then it goes back to grazing and then clinton can do what they want with it and then that's where we'll go in with our monitoring tools like we do our cuttings our monitoring sites and we graze it and if you stick to them grazing tools as you spoke about yesterday in that, and keep everything down. Everything follows hand in hand. Ground cover stays, everything just stays healthy. As long as you, if you get greedy, if you get too much, you take it too far, that's when you start to come unstuck. You, you cause man-made erosion and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Anyone else you <laughs> that was a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. So what you're saying is if you move the water, then there'd be more manure there to help laxidate the soil? On that site there, cool. if I did put water, which but it's not sustainable on, or scalable on big areas, that's what I wanted to say, scalable on big areas, you can't always put water where you want, but for that area there, for my trial, if I put water on that area, I'm fairly certain we would have got the manure we wanted there. So they put it all down at their other water point, take that water point away and put your water point there, and it happened. But it's not scalable. Yep. So, um future projects going forward, Glencore's happy with the results that they're getting from that and that's something that they will be uh, continuing with with their rehabilitation? Yeah, well, I'll, I guess it was a mixed bag. Initial results promising, but yeah. there were a few, I guess, failures in that. But um, I guess there's measures we can implement that will mitigate those failures. So, yeah, definitely keep going with this. Yeah.
Is that all? Any other questions from anyone? No? Wonderful. Yep. Awesome. So hand you back to...